In this episode, we'll be talking about how we've lost the true human nature of services and how we can get it back. We'll talk about what the organizational mechanisms are that allow service design to scale internally. And we'll talk about why there isn't and never will be enough service design talent around. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Joel Bailey, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping service designers like you create organizations that put people at the heart of their business. My guest in this episode is one of the service design pioneers, evangelists, early day adopters. Um, he started the service design drinks and things in London back in 2001, 2002. I've met this person uh, back in 2008 at the service design conference in Amsterdam. If you look at his LinkedIn profile, you'll see that he's worked for uh, the renowned service design companies and his latest service design uh, company is EY Seren. His name is Joel Bailey. Joel has a pretty interesting perspective on why services are actually more important than design and why we need more people who truly and deeply understand what services are. So that's what we'll be talking about in the next 30 minutes. If you haven't subscribed already to this channel, be sure to do that because we bring new episodes that help to level up your service design skills at least once a week. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the chat with Joel. Welcome to the show, Joel. Hey, how are you doing? Nice I'm, to see you. I'm, I'm doing awesome. Good to have you here. One of the pioneers of the service design field. <laughs> oh, we, thank you. Kind of we, we were going back, we were talking about the epic uh, service design conference that took place in Amsterdam, not in 2016, but in 2008. And that was also, like you mentioned, the first and only time that we actually met in person, right? That's right. That's right. Um, I was reminiscing before we started. That is the first and last time we met, but it was a seminal moment for me. Uh, I had been uh, involved in service design for a few years before that, but like in an isolated way. Uh, it had been a, a job title for me only for a couple of years. And myself and a few a handful of people in London had been congregating around a, a service design drinks we'd set up, myself and Nick Marsh and a couple of other people. But that event in Amsterdam that you'd organized, I managed to persuade someone to buy me a ticket for that. And I went along and you had managed to congregate a few people. There was some IDEO guys, guy from McDonald's. It was really inspiring for me, um, uh, being isolated to come over to Amsterdam, hear a bunch of people talk, really inspiring. So I really salute you guys for, for making that happen. It was really great. It was great. <laughs> it's good that uh, a lot of people who were uh, in that space in the Roto Hood back then are sort of still active and are, it's it's a real community. It was back then and it still is today. So, um, Joel, you've been, if I, I was checking your LinkedIn profile as I do before uh, the talks and I was searching um, the first entry of service design in your sort of history and it uh, dates back to somewhere like 2001. Uh, so, so that's a long time. And I'm curious, do you actually remember the first time you got in touch with service design? Yeah, actually, it was a boss of mine who was pretty widely read at that point. And I was working in government at the time on an old website. I mean, this is the era pre-government digital services, a uh, digital service called uh, businesslink.gov.uk, one of the big old super sites. Um, and my boss at the time, Jonathan Hollow, he actually suggested to me the way you're going in your career, I think your next role is to be the service designer. And I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, I, I typed it into, into Google and it came up on Wikipedia and it was like two lines. Uh, and I was like, and I just read it and I was like, that's that's what I want to do, right? And he was right. So I, I again, I salute him as well for, mm. for showing me that path. And, and I did, I took that title and I said, this is what I'm going to do. And, um, and I, I followed that path and I did, could uh, business link uh, with that title 
uh, even though it was very digital and it was going in a certain direction. But I've just followed that ever since. Um, and uh, uh, I've been lucky enough to have found people who have given me roles uh, or I've forged a path and managed to find people who will give me budget. You know how it is, right? And then you find you, you get your foot in a door on certain projects. And, and, and I'll be honest, there's a trade wind going through life at the moment which is service design and it is human centered. And I've managed to follow that trade wind and it's taken me in the right direction. So uh, opportunity knocks and you, and you follow it, right? Yeah, you're riding the wave, yeah. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> it, right? Uh, and, and it's not failed me. Uh, and I think our industry is getting bigger and bigger as a result. And I'm very passionate about those two words, right? Services, and we'll talk about this more, I'm sure, but I'm very passionate about service. Uh, and I'm very passionate about services as human systems. And I don't think as an industry, I think we're very obsessed with design. And don't get me wrong, design is an important thing. But I think services are very important. And I think we have a lot of designers coming into service design who don't necessarily understand service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They understand design a lot. But you have to understand services. You can't just come in as a designer and just be a service designer. You have to understand how services work. How, how, you're, you're getting into the topics already. Oh, I man, see that I'm you're passionate. Myself. I see that you're passionate. Let's uh, <laughs> let's do interview, Jess, Joel, because I okay, I, I think you have a lot to share. Um, topic topics. You gave me three okay. topics, uh, and <clears throat> this one we're going to start with this one: reconnecting okay, this pe end, okay. people to people. Okay. How can we? How can, can we? Pretty glary. How can we reconnect people to people? Right. What do you mean? Okay, so how can we connect people to people? So I have a view that this is an emerging view, but it's come out of all the years of uh, I've been practicing, which is that um, if you go back in history, right, people have always served people, right, for thousands of years. Uh, and I... Um, I think we've, we're born to serve each other, right? Uh, within our family units, if you take it back to that primary unit, uh, the moment we're born, we have to be served for a, num for a number of months, right, in order to live. Uh, uh, and our parents serve us, and then when they get to the end of life, we serve them, right? Now, that's kind of traditional and, and, and the basic, basic fact of life. And I think over the, the eons in, in, in our basic sort of tribal units, service is a part of how we live. Uh, and, 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 and over the years, we have evolved that basic sort of barter format of how we trade within tribes. They've become services. They've become very complicated. And just over the last, let's say, 100 years, they have become vastly more complicated. And if you look at how services in the last just 30, 50 years have scaled in complexity, they have, particularly through technology and through, um, let's say, interfaces and the use of the word interfaces, I think the provider and the, the customer of services have become disintermediated, okay? And increasingly, if you go into these big service organizations, as you and I do, and people listening and watching this show will do, The, the connection between people inside and outside of services has been lost. So when we go and talk to people at the front line of services, who get up every morning to serve people. Like I've worked in public sector services where like adult social care people who get out of work, get out of bed each day to go and help people who are struggling in their lives. That is their deep concern in life is to serve those people. They really struggle to be able to do that. Because the people who are running those services don't have daily contact with those people. They are disconnected with them because the only contact they have with those people is through a dashboard of data that tells them. It's about abstracted. Them. Yeah. It's very abstracted. And I think this is increasingly the case. So the more technology, the more interfaces you put in, this is the paradox of your modern service, is that the more of those things that you put in, the more disintermediated your organization becomes from the human beings you're trying to serve. So paradoxically, I think we're being sold the idea that all this technology is better serving the customer. And it is from a transactional point of view, but actually it actually threatens your organization, makes them quite vulnerable because it removes your corporate instinct and your empathy for how you actually serve mm. that customer. It takes away your relationship with that customer. And so many organizations I go into, 
they don't have an instinct for who their customer is anymore. They don't really understand them. And I'm reading at the moment Sam Walton's autobiography, which is a great like old one that I bought off eBay. And, and it feels like an old book, but it, all of his stuff is so relevant. So he used to make all his senior managers go into store once a week and hang around in store. And then every week he would run a call centrally where they'd have to call in and tell them what he'd learned each hmm. week. That level of contact does not exist in most of our organizations. Right. You know, the, the, I think I, uh, I mentioned this on LinkedIn uh, some time ago, like the role yeah. of technology should not be to have less contact with our customers, but to actually enable us to have more and deeper relationships with our customers, right? I think yep. so, sort of, I, I don't know where it went wrong, but... Right, it, it's it's well, it feels like efficient, but it's it's only efficient if you. How are you going to use the time that technology gives you in a good way? I think where it might have gone wrong is slightly with the capitalist drive of headcount reduction. Yeah, unfortunately, which I think there was a lot of push to get rid of headcount, which I think may have been a slightly miscalculation, right? Because you need those people because people still want people. But the logic of I'm going to get rid of my call center has never been true, right? Because what people now want is not those low value contact points. I don't want to call you with my small phone calls. I want to call you with my long phone calls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really difficult challenges. I want to spend an hour on the phone mm. with you to talk about my really complicated need. And I might cry down the phone with you about my really complicated long term retirement money challenge that because my husband's just died and I don't know what to do. That's a really valuable contact that I need to have with you. But that was never factored into the business case of the big change that you're going through. Everyone just thought, oh, I'll just get rid of the call center and get rid of all those calls. So I think I think that, but I, th I think there is this view though at the top of organizations for these people who don't spend much time with customers that they're kind of, they've, they, they've kind of become, going back to the original question, like how do we reconnect people with people? A lot of the work I'm trying to do in the service design, more agile service design sprint work we're doing is bring those leaders right back into contact with those customers. We bring them back into the research as much as possible. It's not about so that they can see the research insights. It's so they can spend time with customers so they can get that empathetic rush you know, it's like, oh my God, we really need to serve these people better. It's like, like, do you get that back to the floor program in in your in in in, in Holland? Yeah, I, it's a TV show. I, yeah, uh, right. Was, yeah, yeah. It's the, same, it's the same story, right? Yeah. You get the CEO going out yeah, to meet the customer. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, I I think uh, we in the service design community would all applaud more uh, interactions with actual customers, but uh, the the reality for a lot of service designers is, is that it's already challenging to actually get the project team out of the door and and meet people. Um, what, what is your strategy for getting people outside of the project team to actually go on this journey with you? Um, I mean, it does help to have clients who want to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, we do have clients who want to do that. Um, I think um, I push clients to do it right um and i how? sell them on the, yeah how yeah yeah well uh i convince them right <laughs> uh, because i tell them that how good it is right uh, it's, it, there's no science to it yeah i think the, the, the there's an art to it right which is to say it, it's the it's the it's the it's to convey what i believe to be the right thing for them hmm. and to show them the value of it because of what i'm telling you right there, there, there's what I pledge to them is that um, I can get a research team to go out and do this work for you and they will come back to you with a report, but you will get 30% of the value by doing that. If you bring your team and even yourself along, you will get 100% of the value. Mm. What do you want, right? Mm. You want 30% of your money's worth? It's like, uh, I can. That, that's the story I can tell them. And right. usually they want 100% of the value, if not more. Mm. So that's the sort of discussion that we have with them when I'm putting together proposals, and, yeah. and then and then they can choose what value they want for their money. And I, and I think uh, what I also really uh, applaud and uh, hold dearly is that we are, we as service designers should take a stand. Like mm. 
this is the way we we need to do it. This is the way it should be done. Um, if you don't if you don't want to listen, you probably don't need a service designer. Like, take a stance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's true. I think it's true because we. I don't know about you. I mean, there's a lot of demand for our time, and we have to qualify at some point, and we can spend a lot of our time doing work that doesn't as you say ship you know it doesn't deliver value it doesn't cut through and i think at the end of the day we all as service designers want to see our value in the market hmm. and we've all over you know you have you've been in this game as long as i have right we've seen plenty of our work not arrive in the market we've not seen it deliver we've right. not seen it get through all the trade-offs and compromises that come downstream after our work is finished and so we have to find clients that will actually commit to delivering it. And if they're if they're not going to bother going to the research, that's not a great indicator to me that they're going to bother delivering it and get exactly. all the internal fights of delivery. So exactly. it's really important to me to find clients who are up for the actual long haul of this. Hmm. And if they're not going to find a day in their week to go along to customer research, that's not a great indicator. Red flags. Let's move on. Topic yeah. question number two. Well, topic, and it's a topic of scaling which has been on the show in okay. the past so <laughs> i'm curious to hear your perspective on this one okay, i'm gonna go with oh hold on here it comes when will we scale oh there it is when there it is when now I what, can't what are we going to scale exactly Joel? Words i had right behind this scaling <laughs> one this was uh this was the topic of instead of getting buy-in for service design uh, uh, actually yeah. understanding how yeah. to Implement, right. embed, scale, service design. Yeah. So this, one, this one's a big shift, right? So yeah, if, if we go back to when we first met, right, it was all about getting buy-in, right? No one believed me, right? It was all, uh, I, I, I would take anything to get into any room and do any piece of work. And I would literally, um, I take any, any, any brief, uh, any, and I'd do any compromised piece of work just to get, just to get a brief. But now we've come on a long way in the last, gosh, many, many years now. And I think we can be, afford to be a bit more choosy. And so I think that the market's moved on. We're very accepted. There's lots of business value in doing service design. A lot of people understand that. And there are a lot of clients who are willing to, 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 to really follow through on the work. So the new question that we're getting asked is, how do I build my own capability in-house, not just rely on you to do projects, but do full-scale capability build? And I'm lucky enough to have some clients who are going, who are very mature in this now, to the point where they don't really need us mm. so much. Mm. And I work for EY Seren, part of EY, you know. Um, so, so we have lots of clients at different levels of maturity, some so mature that they have their own capability that they're building at quite a rate of knots. Um, and so scaling corporate capability, uh, and I mean corporate in the both public and private sector, is the new challenge, I would say. And um, that's the thing. When I say, when will we scale? I think uh, that is starting to happen. And I think is probably the industry's main challenge. I'll probably lead us on to our third question. But um, uh, for me, is where all the main questions now lie for us as an industry, because, sorry, yeah, no, jump in. Yeah, I'm going to jump in because uh, um, when we were talking about this topic, what I found really interesting is how you framed scaling or how you framed the transition, like going from uh, departments uh, yeah. organized in a way that is uh, organized for production to yeah. uh, organizing around, um, you called it like uh, around the service or the product or uh, the service, the product, the customer. Um, yeah. And then organizing around that. C can you share a little bit about that yeah. transition and how scaling fits into? Yeah. So, so the big discipline that that we all need to get our heads around to make this bit work. There's a few actually, but one of them is certainly systems thinking because you you come across you come up against the system logic of the big organizations that we work in, which is you know the classical management theory of of these organizations, which most of them is based on this factory model of exactly. how organizations run, which is 80 years of classical management theory, which is the consumer is a product to be managed. 
through um, and it's basically something you don't really want to deal with, which is why call centers don't really want to deal with a customer. As soon as you start realizing how an organization really thinks about the customer, not, not because it wants to, but because that's how it's learned to deal with a the customer, then you, as a designer, if you start to really recognize the internal logic of an organization, because that's the way management theory has taught it to think about it, your life gets so much easier because you can really empathize with how the organization thinks. Uh, and then you can start to work with that behavior and start grow, slowly adapt it. Because these organizations um, don't think the way you want to. They're verticalized, right? And all the power and all the money runs vertically. And the CEO and everybody else at the top is desperately trying to change it. But until you start learning that that the system is a product of how it's always been incentivized to, to work, you won't change it, right? So... What we all need as designers need to start becoming much better at is uh, systematic org redesign. And that's where we're, we're now starting to get better at. So we have a business design team who are starting to really get more involved in our work, which is how do we start looking at governance models? How do we mm. start looking at org redesign? So you start really getting into the depths of how do you re incentivize the organization? Mm. Right. Start organizing horizontally. So you start having budgetary cycles that are much shorter so they can work according to agile principles so you can start getting away from committee decision making not my area of expertise but i we cannot succeed unless these things change yeah because otherwise all our design sprints will fail all our design ideas for horizontal journeys will fail this is the new era that we're in so uh what i find really interesting and it is uh for me also basically uncharted uh, territory like what are the instruments uh that govern or the, the way what what are the design materials of a de uh, of an organization like governance mm. like uh incentives um you, you probably can name a few more but and how do we use those to actually redesign how the organization functions yeah Right. Well, the great, the great news here is our service designers, we don't have to be experts. In exactly. Things. So the great thing about working in EY is I'm surrounded by people who are experts in org redesign, in, in governance and all those things, which are quite traditional and very specific and quite technical, but they've all just been doing them in a way that is not changed for a long time. So now I'm turning up and saying, can we kind of turn them 20 degrees to the left? And make them quite different and they're saying oh we've, we've not changed them in many years but they're quite excited because they're like oh yeah let's just change those right let's do that they they know yeah. which knobs they can actually turn yeah and which but levers but it's great turning up to a guy who's never had to change them and saying can we change them but like, yeah i'd love to um hmm. so that's good right so i don't need to be an expert in those things there are plenty of those ex and, and every, every organization has those people right hmm. who have done those well is is that the case because well, you know not. you're you're in the uh position with ey sermon uh smart people around you what if you're like in a small team or maybe you're, you're in an right. internal team like how do how do you actually start to start this That's transition true. yeah yeah, that is true. I, I perhaps was talking for a point of privilege there. The the I mean, there is some good stuff written online about this. Uh, it's a bit scarce, but in turn, there are people starting to write about how you how you have to face into this headwind, um, a, a level up, which is how do you deal with governance? How do you deal with incentive models? The systems thinking aspect of this. It's quite new. And no one's got the right answer. And I'll, I'll be honest, you know, even within the world we're working in, there are no single right answers. There are just themes, the themes that I'm describing. Every organization is trial and error across the board, uh, every client. And even the clients that are quite mature, it's more error than success, I would say. Hmm. Everybody is sort of fumbling around and trying to find the right way to do this. I've, I've also found it interesting that you stated like um, startups, they they don't have the heritage, so they they can implement models that are yeah by, that that have this behavior by default. Yeah, well, they're sort of native. Well, they're 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 they're, they're a blank canvas, right? So they don't have a legacy of governance and committees, right? So, like, uh, the legacy committee thing is bigger than legacy IT. I think every for the last twenty years, I'll be honest, 
I walked around going, oh, legacy IT will kill all my service design projects. And then I had a bit of a moment, probably goes back about four years, where I was on a commuter train surrounded by all the I was working really hard and I was surrounded by all these guys. I, li I live in the commuter belt here out in Surrey, where all these bankers live. And I was looking around and I was working really hard on the late train and they were all sitting there like watching uh, Netflix. And I was like, man, these are all the people that I'm probably up against. They're all in these lovely pensions waiting for retirement. And I thought, it's these legacy people who are sitting on all these committees that I think is the challenge. And actually, that it, it, it is like the legacy people who are kind of sat on all these committees who whose job it is to review papers and to challenge change, who are defending a status quo that I think is probably the bigger challenge in these organizations. You've got a lot of agility down at this lower tier, close to the coal face of change, but then there's a huge rump of management who are quite defensive about change. And I think a lot of these organizations, uh, and, and that's regulated from a regular, I work in financial services quite a lot, and that's quite a regulated rump. And what I mean by the rump is it's, it's, it's a lot of fat in there. And I, I don't want to start saying that you have to cut that all out because the regulator has said you have to have people in there whose job it is to make sure the bank is doing the right thing. And that's the same in any regulated organization. So, but that puts a real drag on change for lots of safe reasons. And banks are very risk averse as a te telecommunications companies. But your challenger banks don't have that, right? They're built right. from the bottom up. They're mostly engineers and a few designers. That's what they are. But um, so they they don't have that that drag on them. But they also don't have lots of other things that these big banks do have. They don't have the huge amount of trust in their brand. They don't have a branch network that has a lot of relational value in them. So you know, if you if you have. could um, to to sort of round off this uh, topic, if you could, yeah, what is how, how how should I formulate this question? Like, what have you seen that works exceptionally well? Is there can you have you found a pattern? Mm, good question. Uh, in terms of relation to scale, yeah, and to actually s starting the shift. Yeah, well, certainly, uh, uh, what I've seen work well is organizing around some form of journey based model, and that's no. That's going to be no surprise to people watching. Well, it's good it. so, that you sort of confirmed that that works. Yeah, you have to kind of organize horizontally, right? And you, but you have to ha then give some form of autonomy to the team who's doing that. They have to be able to act within that team. You have to be able to put people in that team to work for a genuine period of time, and you have to empower them to work um, uh, according to some sort of scrum dynamic so that they can kind of get stuff done. Um, I think you, um, what else do you need to do? You need to uh, have stakeholders, quite senior, come to that group and be sent away to unblock things, which is quite different. So they're not coming along to be told how great things are. They're being sent away with tasks. Right, that's, right. That doesn't happen in these big organizations very often. But that's very empowering for the team to be to have a senior stakeholder sent away to go and fix things. Um, I think you need leadership around design. You need leadership. Uh, what I mean by that is design needs to have some form of empowerment in the organization um, beyond where it currently sits. Most of the money sits within the business. And there are two kingdoms within most organizations. Well, actually, there's one kingdom. The business owns all the money. Design is always trying to get the money out of the business. Uh, ideally, there should be some brokerage of power between design and mm, business. Mm. At the moment, as designers, we're constantly trying to fight for some of the money. Uh, I think I'd like to see over the next couple of years, designers having a bit of budget. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. I, I think it was uh, Mauro Porcini, in, uh, the C chief design officer of PepsiCo, who was on the show, and he said, you know, uh, do we actually want the responsibility of being sort of responsible for profit and loss? Yeah. Be because that would change the game if we would yeah. say like, okay, uh, we'll make sure that the money flows in. We are the business. Like then. Right. Well, I, I, like I see business owners doing that. They're not doing a that great a job, I'd say. Not always. 
Like, why do we think it would be any worse or any better necessarily to have designers doing it? Mm -hmm. I just think we lack credibility necessarily. Mm -hmm. We um, lack, maybe we lack the balls to actually do it. Maybe, and to, well, and, maybe, maybe. Hmm. Uh, like if I look at Dan Mikowski at Lloyd's Banking Group, he should get on the show if you haven't already. He's a good guy. Um, he doesn't necessarily lack the balls, I don't think. <laughs> maybe they lack, maybe they, they don't want to give it to him. I don't know. But, <laughs> but like, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 think, this, yeah. I think that sort of shift like needs to happen. My personal view is, We'll come. We'll be ten years down the road from here, maybe five, depending on the maturity of the organisation. And there should be less of a gap between business and design. Exactly. Right? Design yeah. is essentially problem solving. It's yeah. just a more divergent, bolder, braver way of doing it. Business has not shown that it's done a, had a great track record in these big incumbent service organisations of solving problems in the last mm. ten years. Mm. It, it's proved itself to be pretty poor at it, I'd say. We're moving on into topic number three, the final one. And yeah. it relates to the previous one because this it's, one is called uh, talent growth. And if we want to scale, I guess we need talent. And I have so many questions about this one. Okay, so I think this one for me is how far are we? Oh, this Where, is so yes, how there far? is. Talent how growth, how far? So I'm in this quite gloomy room. Sorry, I, I didn't really set up the, the lighting for this. It was a trade-off between lighting and Wi-Fi signal, and we went uh, for Wi-Fi. I'll always take Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Um, so yeah, how far are we on our road to talent growth, right? So I think this is one of my probably biggest concerns, but also actually my biggest hopes. So there we go, a par hmm. paradox for our third question. So it is my biggest concern if I talk about service design. It's my biggest hope when I talk about designing services, right? So I, I, I put this exactly in that language very, very, um, purposefully. So if I talk about myself as a service designer, I find it's very niche language and I get very worried about the talent market. So I actually, in the last probably year and a half, and I wrote quite a long blog post about this for those who are bothered to, to read such things. We'll link days. to it down below. Of but course. I very yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I very consciously now talk about designing services and designing and building services because we've obviously got to build these things, not just design them. But designing services for me requires an army of people with an army of skills. And some of those people are service designers. And we have to talk about designing and building services if we are going to have any chance of scaling the talent problem that we have. Because we do have a talent problem. Because I'll be honest with you, we, you know, we've been hanging around this industry for a long, long time. And the, the talent hasn't grown exponentially. We've got a lot more people turning up. And there are lots of people who are very talented and some people who are quite talented, people who are learning as they go. But there aren't enough people to do all the work that's coming through the door. So for me, what we have got, though, is a lot of product designers. We've got a lot of visual designers. And just in our business alone, we've got business designers, product designers, visual designers. I've got re a research practice that I'm responsible for, a design research practice. We've got storytellers. And equally, if I look out more broadly across EY, I've got like reg, reg tech experts. I've got um, people who are experts in sectors like you wouldn't believe. All of them very talented, very smart people. All of them employed by service organizations day in, day out. Why would I not want them working on the design of a service? I do want them on the work, working on that. And equally, the client brings all of their experts along. And I've never yet worked on a project or an engagement with a client where they haven't brought along a bunch of super resourceful people. And in the immersion week where I essentially bring them into the project and we do a, you know, an immersion week for us, by the way, is a kind of educational <laughs> deep dive. We throw them in the room. We say, this is what service design is. This is what systems thinking is. This is what behavioral economics is. And we kind of sort of explode them a little bit. And then by the end of that week, they're like, I don't want to go and do anything else. It's fun, right? I love it. And it's all about tapping into their resourcefulness. So for me, if, we, if we're going to stay as an industry narrow on service design, we will fail. But if we go broad and tap into the resourcefulness of people turning their minds and skills to designing services, then we will succeed. So <clears throat> you mentioned a lot of different skills, a lot of different roles. Um, how... how is, where and how do we find those people? And who are these people? They're everywhere. 
Yeah, exactly. So what, why why is talent growth an issue? Well, I don't I don't necessarily think it is. I think it's called I think it's talent gathering, right? I think it's talent gathering and it's talent onboarding. I don't really like that word. Mm -hmm. Bringing the right talent to bear in the under the right conditions and motivating them to work in the right yeah under the right conditions in the right scenario so uh the i have this the what the, the methodology i don't really even like calling it the mindset and methodology that we work with in ey Serum, specifically that i adopt with the teams that i work with is this kind of agile approach to service design that it involves those different different mixed methodologies that i described earlier that it, it, it involves a very broad church of people. We'll put a mixed team set in the room with the client, and depending on who that who they can bring in and who we can bring in, it might have a mixture of the client's team there and our team. It'll have people who come from a subject matter expert background. It'll have people from EY who can come in as well. So we'll have quite a mixed playing field, um, mixed set, le mixed group of team members on the playing field, and, and no one really knows who's from which part of the team. But the key thing is to work out what individual resources those individuals bring. And what we will then seek to do is make the most out of the resources those people bring. Hmm. Um, so it, it does sound like it's almost quite woolly, um, but this is what our, our clients need. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, most of the skills that our clients' uh, uh, employees bring to the table historically, like I've got people turning up who used to be project managers who have suddenly been told that they're now pro product managers, right? This is quite a common art thing, right? And the difference between a project manager yesterday and a product manager today, like you can't just switch someone from one to the other overnight. They're fundamentally different mm -hmm. mindsets. Uh, uh, and yet that's the sort of challenge we've been given. So our role is to is to really coach people through this and to take them, I hate this on a journey sort of language, but we do have to take them on a bit of a journey. And that is what we bring to the, to the work we do with them. It's quite facilitative uh, and we are helping them to go through that. But um, uh, we cannot rely. I mean, obviously we have to bring some of our very skilled individual service designers, product designers, uh, visual designers to that room, researchers to that room. So don't get me wrong. We are hiring those guys and we are continually <laughs> hiring those guys into our into our company. But we cannot just rely on it. We are looking for resourceful individuals from our client teams and more broadly from across EY to, to participate in that work because we can't scale in any other way. Right. So I I I hire into those um, those squads, if you like, looking for people who have soft skills and future capability as much as I do looking for the hard skills of service design. Hmm. That's a long question. Well, I, I, uh, I think you will actually enjoy the previous episode with Patrick Bach, who's... Uh, you sent me the link and I need to listen to it. You, you need I to, really and especially the third uh, uh, okay. uh, topic. And people yeah, who are... The, the, the fans of the show who've listened to the previous episode will know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, Joel, we spent a lot of time in this episode and I... Uh, do want you want to give you the opportunity to ask us us a question, the listeners, the viewers. Is there anything on your mind that we could sort of chew upon? I think I'd like to ask the listeners, viewers, um, where they think an organization like EY Seren should be focusing its energy on where to go next, right? Because, like, we have our own ideas about... Um, uh, what the future has in store. Uh, and you can obviously hear I'm constantly thinking about this, constantly thinking about what the future holds. But, um, and I've been reading some really interesting books recently about where the future of the practice goes that, you know, like the, the thinking in services book you've had, have you had Majid uh, on oh, recently? Yeah, he's, he's from my town, actually. Oh, cool. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, it, like not that, on the show yet. Yeah. yeah. That book's just great. Right. So, but I, uh, a question to the to the to the to the group is yeah like um, as an organisation who is part of a big organisation who is looking to its own proposition about what it wants to do in the world like what do, what 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 would a a service designer out there in the world be looking from an organisation like us right that's a question I'm really curious to ask we we can ask our internal people but I'd like to know from the outside. Mm. What, what do people expect from an organization like us? What do they like to see from us? 
there's a question. I think a lot of people will be interesting, interested in the answers to this one. So let's see yeah. what happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joel, man, we could talk for another half oh, an hour at it. least, at yeah. least. So, uh, uh, but we're not going to do that because uh, we want to <laughs> respect the time of our audience. Uh, if there's more to it, then uh, be sure to comment and uh, continue your conversation down there. Thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing what's on your mind. Uh, it was a pleasure. A yeah, great pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So what is your take on Joel's question? What role should service design agencies play? Leave your comments down below. And I challenge you, if you know somebody who might enjoy this episode as well, grab the link and share it with them and help to grow the Service Design Show community. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.